When you sing a song into a mic, it converts the changes in the air pressure into changes in electric current. Now, if you attach this to a speaker, then it converts these changes in the current back to sound. But you will probably hear nothing. And the reason for that is because this current produced by the microphone is very tiny, causing extremely tiny vibrations, and as a result, you will hear nothing. But if you could somehow increase the strength of the current over here and keep the pattern exactly the same, and now, since the current has increased, the speaker will vibrate very nicely, and since the pattern is exactly the same, you'll pretty much hear his voice and his song. So in order to make this thing successfully work, we need a device in between that increases the strength of the current, but at the same time keeps the pattern exactly the same. Such devices which do that are called amplifiers. And usually these amplifiers are found inside the speakers themselves. Now earlier amplifiers were big and bulky, which made our speakers, our devices big and bulky. So in order to build, let's say, a pocket radio, or maybe to build headphones, we needed to make tiny amplifiers. And it was this trio, Shockley, Bratain, and Bardeen, working at Bell Labs, realized the key to building a very tiny amplifier was using doped semiconductors. And after a lot of research and experiments, they finally invented the first semiconductor amplifier in around 1947-1948. So, let's find out what they did. Their idea was to use an N-type semiconductor with a lot of electrons and sandwich in between a P-type semiconductor with very few holes, like this. Or, or, another thing that you could do is take a P-type semiconductor with a lot of holes and sandwich in between an N-type semiconductor with very few electrons. They called it the transistor. The transistor. And we'll see the reason behind this name in the future videos. But since this material has N over here, then it has a P, and it has an N type again, we call this as the NPN transistor. And similarly, if you look at this one, you have P, this is the P type, then the N type, then again the P type, we call this as the PNP transistor. And the key to working of this is that this middle region, that is this, that's the key actually, this middle region that we have, the P type here and the N type here, it should satisfy two conditions. One, it has to be very thin, and we'll see why in a minute. It has to be very thin. And two, it has to be very lightly doped. Very lightly doped. As you can see, the doping here is much smaller than what you have over here, same thing over here. We'll see now that under such circumstances, these things will act like an amplifier. So we can look at either the NPN or the PNP. Let's, let's look at NPN and see how it can act as an amplifier. So here is our NPN transistor. Let's begin by attaching a power supply across its ends. So let's put some metallic contacts. And let's say we attach the positive of the power supply here. Um, let's say about five volts, so plus five volt. The negative, which is usually the ground, we're gonna connect that over here. This is the ground. And by the way, I'm not showing the power supply. If it was a real circuit, a practical circuit would be like this. You would have a positive of the power supply here, the negative of the power supply right over there, and that would be connected over here. But I'm, I'm just ignoring this part of the circuit. It's there, of course, but I'm ignoring that so we can focus more on the transistor action. So what do you think is going to happen? Just pause the video and think about this. Well, since we have a positive over here, we might expect the electrons to get pulled out like this and we might have a current over here, electrons flowing like this. But in order for that to happen, the electrons must continuously flow from this region into this region as well, right? We need electron flow everywhere. But can the electrons from this region flow into this region? The answer is no. And the reason is, remember that at every PN junction, there is a depletion region, which acts like a barrier for the flow of majority charge carriers. The electrons are the majority over here, they really like to flow from here to here due to diffusion, but the barrier prevents them. And as a result, since these electrons can't flow from here to here due to the barrier, these electrons can't get pulled across, and there will be no current in the circuit. 
And regardless of what voltage you put, even if you put a 10 volts or a 15 volts over here, you can't, you don't expect any current, so there'll be nothing. Now, if you really want a current, you know what we could do? We could attach another terminal over here. We could attach another terminal and put another circuit over here. Say we apply a positive to this, a positive, again, I'm not gonna draw the entire circuit. I'm just gonna draw the positive through this. Let's say we put about a positive 0.7 volt over here. And we'll see in a while why I'm choosing 0.7 volt. What do you think is going to happen? Again, pause the video and think about this. Well, now if you look carefully, notice the P is connected to more positive than this N. This N is grounded. And as a result, we are forward biasing this junction. So if you take this, this junction is being forward biased. And similarly, if you look at this junction, notice the N is connected to more positive than P. And as a result, this is reverse biased. This is reverse biased. And now remember that in a, when a PN junction is reverse biased, it doesn't allow the flow of majority charge carriers. And so these electrons and holes can't flow across. But this junction is forward biased. Under forward bias, uh, the majority charge carriers can flow across, they can diffuse into each other. And guess what? Uh, if you remember for silicon, if you hit 0.7 volt, that's when the depletion region vanishes. And as a result, these electrons and holes can now easily diffuse into each other. So let me show that. So these electrons will start diffusing into the P. And of course, these holes will also diffuse over here, but I'm gonna neglect the holes because they're very, very tiny in number anyways. Now the question is what's going to happen to these electrons? And now we're reaching the climax of the transistor action, all right? Notice that these electrons can either be pulled out from here because of the positive, or they can be pulled out from here because of the positive here. What's going to happen? Well, remember that whenever we have a forward bias PN junction, in order for those electrons to get pulled out, they have to undergo recombination. We have spoken a lot about this in previous videos, so if you need more clarity, it would be great to watch that. But anyways, in order for the electrons to get pulled out, they have to undergo recombination. And the recombination chances over here in the transistor is very, very small for two reasons. One is because this P region is very lightly doped. So there are a small number of holes to begin with. And as a result, the recombination chances are small. But the second reason is that this is very thin. And as a result, most of the electrons that get injected over here will find themselves already at this end. And as a result, they can now be pulled by this voltage. You can also think of it this way. You see, when they're reaching this, uh, uh, this junction, because it is reverse biased, remember a reverse bias doesn't allow majority charge carriers to flow through, but they accelerate minority charge carriers, right? And these electrons in the P region are the minority charge carriers. So because of the electric field, they get accelerated and they get collected over here and then they, they can you know flow through the terminal over here. So what's happening over here is that most of the electrons which get injected will just come out from here and only a fraction of them will get recombined and as a result they get pulled out from here. So if you were to put some numbers, if you were to put some numbers, we could say about 100 electrons are being injected per second. 100 electrons are injected per second and maybe due to recombination only one electron is being pulled out from this terminal so one electron per second. And as a result, about 99 electrons get pulled out from here. 99 electrons get pulled out from here. Which means the current in this wire is about 99 times the current in this wire. And you may be like, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, well, let's think of it this way. You see, in order to pull one electron from here, when we try to pull one electron from here, about 99 electrons gets pulled out from here, right? That's the way we can think about this. Well, now imagine if we increase this voltage and try to pull more electrons from here. Let's say I tried to pull two electrons from here. What will happen? Well, we have the statistics here. We've seen that almost out of 100, one gets pulled out. So in order to get pull, so to remove two, about 200 will get injected. They have to get injected, right? You're increasing the forward bias voltage, more will get injected. About 200 will get injected, two comes out from here, that means 199 will, 198 will get collected over here. That means notice when you double this, this also has doubled. And if this were to triple, this would be triple. If this were to half, 
this would be half and so on. In other words, if the current in this wire fluctuates, the current in this wire would fluctuate in exactly the same manner. However, the current over here will always be 99 times more than the current over here. In other words, this is this, the current in this wire is the amplified version of the current in this wire. And that's exactly what we needed. And so if you want to use this to amplify your sound, then you can connect your microphone wire over here. Now, the microphone will be the one that will provide the voltage over here needed to forward bias this junction. And the voltage provided by the microphone will depend upon the sound. If your sound is very loud, this voltage will be high. If the sound is very low, like you're whispering, the voltage will be very low over here. Of course, the engineers will make sure that the voltage over here will never go below 0.7 volt and all of that stuff. But don't worry, this voltage will fluctuate pretty much depending upon your sound. And as a result, the current in this wire will also fluctuate depending on your sound. Now guess what? The current in this wire will fluctuate in this exactly the same manner as the current fluctuates over here. That's what we saw. But it is 99 times more, so it's amplified. So if we feed this now to a speaker, then in the speaker, the sound generated will be much louder than the sound that you're producing over here. But the pattern of that sound will be exactly the same because the fluctuations are exactly the same, which mean that sound will be exactly like your voice but it'll be much louder. And that's how a transistor can be used as an amplifier.